Welcome, curious minds. Today, we're doing a deep dive into, well, something a bit counterintuitive in science. Yeah, we're exploring how those moments that look like huge failures. Are you mental ones sometimes? Exactly. How they often become the very foundation for uh, some of humanity's biggest breakthroughs. Think of this as your shortcut, maybe, to understanding how science really works. It's messy brilliant and ultimately yeah pretty triumphant so the source material we're digging into today is called success in science seven stories of failure and breakthrough great title isn't it and our mission really is to pull out the key lessons here how these mistakes these setbacks even total blunders sometimes right they aren't just you know roadblocks often they're the actual path to finding something new you've really hit on something fundamental there because it's easy to think science is this um clean straight line to the truth like in textbooks exactly like textbooks but the reality it's much more like a winding road it's all about constant experimentation hitting dead ends making errors and learning from them absolutely learning from what doesn't work mm -hmm. science pushes forward by tackling obstacles and look those failures they're not just detours often they're the journey they give you crucial information i really like that way of putting it you know the physicist max planck had that maybe slightly grim, quote about science progressing one funeral at a time. Uh-huh. Suggesting old ideas have to die off. Right. But today, we're looking at something more positive, I think. More like scientific resurrections. Resurrections, I like that. Yeah, how something that seems like a dead end suddenly transforms into a revolution. And we've got seven uh, really fantastic stories lined up to show you exactly how this happened. So let's get into it. Okay, story number one. We're going back to 1928 picture this. London, a lab, kind of cluttered probably. Belongs to Alexander Fleming, a Scottish scientist. Exactly. He gets back from holiday, looks at his Petri dishes. They're meant to be growing Staphylococcus bacteria. Standard stuff. But they're contaminated. There's this mold, penicillium, notatum, growing where it shouldn't be. Now, most people. You just bit them, right? Start over, contaminated sample. Totally. I know I would. But Fleming, he had this, I don't know, curiosity. He decided to actually look closer and what he saw next. Well, that was the light bulb moment, wasn't it? The big aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. The mold was visibly killing the bacteria around it, creating this clear zone. Amazing. And just like that, you've got the dawn of the antibiotic age. Fleming himself said, uh, one sometimes finds what one is not looking for. But here's the twist, or maybe the, uh, the next chapter. Fleming's discovery, incredible as it was, mm -hmm. it wasn't an immediate home run. How so? Well, he actually really struggled to isolate the active bit, the penicillin itself, yeah. and stabilizing it, making it usable. That was tough. Ah, uh, okay. So for years, this amazing potential just sat there kind of undeveloped. That's a really crucial point. So the initial genius moment didn't immediately translate. How often does that happen? You know, discovery hits a wall, needs someone else to pick it up. What are the usual sticking points? That's a great question. And it happens more often than you'd think. Yeah. Going from that lab bench observation to something you can actually use widely, it's often a long haul. Right. The bottlenecks are usually things like uh, purification, getting the pure compound, scaling up production, making enough of it. Makes sense. And then proving it works safely in you know people, not just Petri dishes. All those were hurdles for penicillin. So who cracked it? It really took Howard Florey and Ernst Boris Chain working in the 1940s. They were the ones who figured out how to produce penicillin on a large scale. Just in time for World War II. Exactly. It became this miracle drug, saved countless lives. Wow. It's a powerful reminder, isn't it? Even accidental breakthroughs often need so much more work, more persistence, to really become something transformative, yeah. a failure that sort of matured into a miracle. Okay, let's jump from the microscope right out into space to 1990. Hubble. Hubble. NASA launches the Hubble Space Telescope. Huge expectations, right? Costing, what, one and a half billion dollars? A massive undertaking. Everyone was waiting for these crystal clear images of the universe. And the first images come back and they're, well, they're rubbish. Huh. Yeah, blurry, fuzzy, just completely out of focus. A disaster. The cause. Something incredibly tiny. A flaw in the main mirror. Just two microns across. That's thinner than one of your hairs. Unbelievable. Such a tiny error on such a massive, expensive project. The embarrassment for NASA must have been intense. And the public were, understandably, pretty furious. Yeah. But this is where the story turns, isn't it? From total disaster to um, sheer defiance. Yeah. NASA's engineers 
They just refused to accept it was over. They didn't just write it off. Not a chance. Yeah. They came up with this incredibly audacious plan, a repair mission in orbit. In space. How? In 1993, astronauts went up on the space shuttle. They performed these really daring spacewalks and essentially fitted Hubble with corrective lenses, like giving the telescope glasses. That's just amazing. Beyond the technical skill, what does that say about NASA? Mm -hmm. About their culture facing down such a public failure? It really says so much about sticking to the mission. That whole spirit, you know, often linked to Gene Cranstring, Apollo 13. Failure is not an option. Right. But maybe here it means not that you avoid failure, but that you absolutely refuse to let failure be the end. You overcome it. And the result? Pure triumph. Hubble started sending back those breathtaking images we all know. Yes. Colliding galaxies, nebulae where stars are born. It completely changed our view of the cosmos. An incredible turnaround, a failure that really taught us about precision, I suppose, and definitely about patience. Okay, let's switch gears again. Back down to Earth and back in time to the very beginning of aviation. The Wright brothers. Orville and Wilbur, chasing this dream of flight when most people thought it was, you know, pure fantasy. Possible. But what often gets glossed over is the sheer amount of struggle. Before that famous flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903, they did over 700 test flights. 700. And most of them failed. Crashes, repairs, going back to the drawing board again and again. What set them apart, though, was their approach. It was quite innovative. They built a wind tunnel. Which was pretty revolutionary back then. Yeah. Tested over 200 different wing shapes. Really methodical. While others were just trying to stick bigger, more powerful engines on things. Brute force. Right. The Wrights were focused on aerodynamics. Mm. On control. Yeah. And just sticking with it. Relentless persistence. And that persistence came from a certain mindset, didn't it? Mm. Orville Wright said something like, uh, if we worked on the assumption that what is accepted is true really is true, there would be little hope for advance. Question everything. Exactly. They constantly challenged the known facts about flight. They weren't limited by what everyone else thought was possible. That is fascinating. Their methodical way of dealing with failure really stands out. What do you think made their trial and error process work? Why did they succeed when so many others with similar dreams failed? Well, I think it boils down to their scientific rigor. They weren't just crashing and rebuilding randomly. They were learning. Precisely. Mm. Each failure, each crash, wasn't just a setback. It was data, information. Mm. They kind of embraced this idea that the plane flew because it crashed first. Wow. It perfectly highlights that iterative process. You try, you fail, you learn, you adjust, you try again. That's innovation. It really makes you appreciate, doesn't it, how many attempts go into things we now just see as normal, like getting on a plane. It's all built on this mountain of prior failures. Okay, our next story is about a truly brilliant scientist, Barbara McClintock, and a discovery that was just ignored for decades. A tough story, this one. Yeah. Back in the 1940s, she was a geneticist, and she discovered something revolutionary. Jumping genes. Transposants, yeah. Bits of DNA that could actually move around within the genome. Which sounds maybe normal now, but back then? It flew completely in the face of what everyone knew about genetics. Mm -hmm. The dogma was that genes stayed put, fixed locations. So her work was just too radical. Pretty much. Her colleagues, they mostly dismissed it. Couldn't really wrap their heads around it or didn't want to. The skepticism was so strong that eventually she just stopped publishing her findings on it for years. That must have been incredibly isolating. But she didn't give up on the science itself. No. And that's the remarkable part. Her resilience was extraordinary. She didn't abandon her research or doubt her own observations. She just waited. Waited for the rest of the scientific world to catch up. Essentially, yes. Yeah. She kept doing her meticulous work quietly. And eventually, technology and understanding evolved, and others started seeing similar things. So she was vindicated. Absolutely. But the delay, it was huge. She finally got the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1983. 1983. But she discovered it in the 40s. Nearly 40 years later. 40 years. I mean, can you imagine holding on to a fundamental truth like that for decades while everyone else says you're wrong? What kind of inner strength does that take? It takes incredible conviction and inner knowledge, as she put it. She mm -hmm. famously said, if you know you're on the right track, if you have this inner knowledge, then nobody can turn you off. Wow. It just underscores how vital that self-belief, that intellectual integrity can be especially when you're challenging the status quo. Mm. Her story really is one of silence genius finally getting its due. A powerful reminder that sometimes the truth takes a very long time to be accepted. 
All right, you can't really talk about failure and persistence and invention without mentioning Thomas Edison, and right? The light bulb guy. Yeah. And so much more. Exactly. His quest for a practical, long lasting electric light bulb, yeah. specifically finding the right filament, that was a massive undertaking. He tested thousands of materials. Over a thousand, yeah. Just think about that process, trial after trial after trial. And there's that famous story, isn't there? A reporter asks him if he's discouraged by all the failures. Thousands of failures. Right. And Edison supposedly replies, you know, in that classic way of his. I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Or something to that effect. It perfectly captures that mindset. And eventually, his team did find it. They landed on a carbonized bamboo filament. Bamboo. Yep. And it lasted over 1,200 hours. That was the breakthrough they needed. But think of the sheer grit required to get there. It is remarkable. What do you think allows someone to maintain that perspective? To see, you know, 10,000 wrong ways as actual progress, not just reasons to give up? I think it has to be a combination of things. Having a really clear vision of the end goal is one. Right, the working light bulb. And also fundamentally understanding that experimentation, especially in material science like that, is a process of elimination. Each failure isn't wasted effort. It's valuable information. It tells you, okay, not that way. Narrows the possibilities. Exactly. And if you connect that historical slog to us today, well, the fact that we can just flick a switch and have light. Or look at our phone screens. All of it. It owes a huge debt to those countless persistent fumbles in the dark, as you might say. It really shows how foundational that kind of trial and error can be. It really does make you stop and think, how much of our everyday world is built on these unseen histories of just trying and failing over and over again. Okay, our sixth story takes us into a field that's seen, well, a lot of heartbreak and difficulty. Alzheimer's research. A really tough challenge. Dr. Alois Alzheimer first described the disease way back in 1906. And here we are, over a century later, still searching for a cure. The path has been littered with setbacks, hasn't it? Immense setbacks. Billions of dollars poured into research. Dozens and dozens of drug trials that looked promising. And then failed, often in late stages. Exactly. Decades of it. It's led to a lot of frustration, a lot of dashed hopes for patients and families. But, and it's an important but, despite all those dead ends, we have seen some progress recently. It's incremental, but it's there. You mean drugs like Adahome and Liquimbi? Right. Adahome's approval in 2021 was uh, controversial, targeting those amyloid plaques. But then Liquembi in 2023 showed, you know, a modest but statistically significant slowing of cognitive decline in early Alzheimer's. So not cures. Definitely not cures. But they represent real steps forward, steps built on understanding gained from all those previous failures. That's a really key point, isn't it? Sometimes progress isn't a giant leap. It's measured in inches. In a field like Alzheimer's, where the ultimate goal, a cure, is still elusive, how do researchers even define success to keep going? That is such a profound question for everyone in that field. I think success has had to be redefined along the way. How so? It shifts from maybe just aiming for the cure to achieving a better understanding of the disease mechanisms, identifying biomarkers earlier, developing treatments that can slow progression, even modestly. Every bit of knowledge helps. And the people involved. Oh, the true heroes here. It's not just the successful drugs, it's the scientists who've spent entire careers facing discouragement, meticulously working on the problem. And the patients. And absolutely, the patients and their families, the ones who volunteer for clinical trials, often knowing it might not help them directly, but doing it for the sake of future generations. Mm -hmm. It really brings to mind that Einstein quote, doesn't it? The important thing is to never stop cautioning. Our final story brings us right to the cutting edge. CRISPR. Gene editing. Huge potential. It feels like science fiction becoming reality, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The power to edit DNA, potentially cure genetic diseases. It could fundamentally change medicine, change life itself. But where did this revolutionary tool come from? Its origin story is actually rooted in, well, what looked like a failure in bacteria. A failure of their immune system, almost. Yeah. Scientists were studying bacteria and noticed these really weird repetitive sequences in their DNA. Clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Exactly, CRISPR. And these bacteria seemed to be holding on to little fragments of DNA from viruses that had previously attacked them. So at first glance, it might have just seemed like a strange biological quirk. Maybe even a sign the bacteria's defenses weren't quite working right, letting bits of virus in. Like leftover junk DNA? Kind of. Yeah. But it turned out to be the opposite. It was actually an incredibly sophisticated defense mechanism. How did it work? 
the bacteria were storing those viral DNA fragments so they can recognize the same virus if it attacked again. It was like a genetic memory, an adaptive immune system for bacteria. Okay, so this bacterial quirk, this way they handled past failures against viruses, turned out to be key. What was the big leap? How did scientists go from observing that in bacteria to creating a tool we can use? That pivotal insight came primarily from Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. They figured out that this natural bacterial system... The one based on remembering past attacks. Right. They realized it could be engineered. It could be programmed to find specific DNA sequences in other organisms, including us. And cut them. Precisely. Cut and potentially edit or replace them. As Jennifer Doudna herself put it, CRISPR is a discovery born not just from biology, but from observing nature's response to failure. That is genuinely mind-blowing, that one of the most powerful tools we have in modern biology came directly from watching how bacteria learn from their own encounters with failure, with viral attacks. So if we step back and look at all seven of these stories, penicillin, Hubble, the Wright brothers, McClintock, Edison, Alzheimer's research, CRISPR, what's the big takeaway? I think the core lesson is pretty clear, isn't it? The failure in science isn't the end. Exactly. It's not the final word. It's more like a signal, a vital piece of information, a compass maybe pointing you away from what doesn't work. And therefore closer to what might. Precisely. It narrows the search space. It's just a fundamental, unavoidable, even necessary part of the whole process of discovery. It circles back to that idea we started with. Failure isn't the opposite of success. It's part of it. It's an intrinsic part of it. And, you know, this doesn't just apply to scientists and labs. No, you're right. Think about how this plays out everywhere. In your own life, your work, any creative thing you try. Those moments where things don't go as planned. They're learning opportunities. Invaluable data, if you look at it that way. Absolutely. So, for everyone listening, whether you're maybe a student struggling with something difficult or a researcher hitting a wall. Or just anyone trying to figure something out. Right. Remember these stories, your own failures, those moments where things don't work out. They might actually be laying the groundwork for your own breakthrough. The information you get from something not working is maybe the most valuable kind. And that leads to maybe a final thought for you to take away and chew on after this deep dive. Go on. What if you intentionally embrace the possibility of failure more often? What if, in your own projects or learning, you weren't afraid to push the boundaries, knowing that even if you stumble, you'll learn something crucial? How might that actually accelerate your progress? That's a powerful question to ponder. Well, this has been another deep dive, hopefully enriching your mind and sparking some curiosity. Until next time, keep questioning, keep learning, and really, don't be afraid to fail. <laughs>